Off the cuff. Guess I need my mic near my mouth. Hey, everybody. It's live stream time. Gotta get everything organized. Hey, Sue. Hey, Mike. Mike and Sue Laprees have joined the place. Awesome. Um, okay, we're gonna bring this up front. So today I'm gonna do a live stream episode. I took questions online for this one, but if I see ones in the comments, I'll do my best to handle those as well. We'll go about half an hour, probably, maybe a little bit longer, and then we'll wrap it up. It is a Wednesday show, so we'd like to keep it to half an hour today. And is is my sound okay, Sue, or am I overdriving? Can you hear my air conditioning going in the background? I better turn that off. Oh, that's good. Okay. Well, now I know there's no interference. I have like Bill Clinton mouth going on here. I think it's because I took my zinc right before now. It makes, makes my body do all sorts of weird things. Okay. We're going to get going with this. Today's topic is website Q&A, but it's a web Wednesday episode. And as always, what I'll do is I will record the episode and be live on YouTube. And then also, um, hi, buddy. I will, you know, if there's a problem, I'll, I'll uh, go back and fix it. I need to wipe my mouth. Ugh. I'm a heathen. I don't have a Kleenex on my desk. <laughs> I just took a big drink of water to try to get my Bill Clinton mouth taken care of. But now it's good. Now it's good. So we'll go into this thing. Well, welcome to Living Free in Tennessee. Today is Wednesday, July 29, 2020, and this is episode 331 of Living Free in Tennessee. And today we're going to talk about website questions that you have, and I'm going to record it on, live on YouTube as well. So if any of the folks watching on YouTube pose a question, I'll do my best to answer those. This is a follow-up to an episode I did last week just talking about website basics, especially if you're just getting started. and it's I've, I've gotten some email questions. I've gotten some questions on social and I thought, you know, let's just answer some of these questions so people can move forward with their website. The worst thing guys, when you're recording audio is when you need to burp. I just had a big old swig of fizzy water. This is for the YouTube people only. That didn't go well. Hi, Crystal. <laughs> okay. You never, you don't want to be speaking and then just like speak burp on your podcast. You don't want that. And I could like totally feel that one coming. So there we go. Everything settled again. See, I hit pause all the time when I'm recording sometimes. Also, if you are listening to this web this uh, podcast on a podcatcher, you will notice that episode 331 is coming out before episode 330. That's because I, I have been sick for the last few days, pretty much since last Friday. And I did not record on Monday, and that would have been episode 330, and that would have been under the topic of jump. So instead of recording it, I asked folks over on MeWe to record their ideas about jump, and I got some good ones. So my plan is to put those together and play them, if everybody's up for me doing that, in an episode called Jump, and then I will talk to you about my concepts of jump, and I will call it episode 330, so we have all of our numbers taken care of. But we're going a little bit out of order here because I figured it was most important to get the Wednesday episode recorded as expected. Today is Wednesday, and we all know what that means, right? It's Holler Hat Wednesday. For those of you on YouTube, if you look behind me, there's a Christmas tree. Because if you put Christmas trees in your attic around here, well, you get lots of spiders in them. So I just keep it in my office. Anyway... Holler Hat's hanging out there today, but she went on an adventure and I've put a picture up on Instagram. That's at Nicole Sauce on Instagram. Tell me where you think she went. Where did she go? Okay. Also, tomorrow is a special edition of the YouTube neighbor live stream. We have a new neighbor coming in, new neighbor coming in. And if you want to guess who that might be, you can, but you'll know tomorrow on the live stream. So We'll be doing that at 7 p.m. Central Time, and it'll be at YouTube on my channel, Living Free in Tennessee. Shockingly named the same thing as this podcast. I know. Crazy. Finally, final announcement. This is like the episode of announcements. 
uh, we have started, I have joined with a team of other podcasters who are freedom oriented to do the Agorist podcast known as Unloose the Goose. Episode three comes out today. It came out today already. It's at unloosethegoose.com if you want to check it out. Or just search under the Agorist podcast or Unloose the Goose on any, pretty much any podcast player and you'll find it. You can listen to that. We talked about status jujitsu last night. Ways to get around the system to do what you want to do anyway and how community plays into that. It was a really great talk last night. I, I hated to cut it off when we did, but we were already at an hour. So if you're kind of, if you're into this podcast for the homesteading and the canning recipes and some of the small business stuff, but not so into the freedom thing, that's cool. That may not be up your alley. But if you're kind of, you know, when you hear me go on one of my thought of the walk liberty rants, uh, if you kind of like those, you'll kind of like this. So for those of you who like that, it's Unloose the Goose. Dot com. With that, I am going to jump straight into my first segment, and it is Stump the Sauce, and it is Stump the Sauce from Nicole Sauce. I stumped myself. So this year, I got way more beets than I've ever gotten before, in part because I had no faith in my ability to grow beets. I have been trying to grow beets for years. Some years I don't try, but usually what I get are some beet greens, which are fine. They're tasty, right? Saute those puppies up. They're really good. They're Almost like Swiss chard, not quite. And so this year I dutifully planted my beets and I dutifully ordered my beets. And then one of the farmers I ordered them from told me if I wanted all the rest of his beets, I could have them because he needed to clean out that row so he could plant his fall garden beans, like his green beans that he will sell in the fall. And I said, sure. And I ended up with two big boxes of beets. And then I went to my garden and guess what? I grew beets successfully for the first time this year, you know, more than one or two beets, like most of my beets turned out. So I've been swimming in beets and I usually make pickled beets. I do a sweet pickled beet and a sour pickled beet. Both of those recipes, if you just Google beets and look for one of my early episodes about beets, you'll see them there on, on the episode, or you can listen to it. And as I was pickling and pickling and pickling and pickling more beets, I realized that maybe I should make something besides pickled beets. And I still had a box and a half of beets left. So I put out on the podcast, if you have recipes, let me know. And Janet and Dory came through and then I can't remember who told me about beet chips. So here are the ideas that were thrown my way. A, Dory, who from 40 Acres in a Cave, told me she has just made kvass. Kvass is like a fermented beet juice. It's really good for digestion. If you're having acid reflux, it's fermented and it's beets and it can really help with your acid reflux. So she said she just made it and loved it. Here's the thing about kvass. If you don't like beets, you're not going to like it. And if when you're drinking something, you're kind of used to more of a sweet flavor, kvass is not that. It's, it's almost like if you think broth as you're drinking it, you'll like the flavor but if you think refreshing cold drink while you're drinking it, you're not going to like the flavor. And then, of course, visually, it's the color of wine. So, you know, when you look at it, you're kind of thinking, mm, grape juice. And it is not grape juice. <laughs> yeah, but it is really good. And I've, I've used it last time. I like two years ago, I had pneumonia. For those of you who've been listening to the podcast that long. And they put me on crazy antibiotics. And it totally messed up my gut. And then I had all sorts of nutritional vitamin absorption problems. And kvass was one of the many fermented things I started eating every day just to try to get my system back with all the right bacteria in it. So that was a great idea. Uh, I had already processed all my beets when I got that. So if my fall planting of beets does actually germinate and happen, because I decided, well, if I've grown them successfully once, why not try them in the fall, fall garden? I'll try that this fall. Another person suggested beet chips, and this was on social, and I didn't catch who it was, but the day I heard beet chips was the day I took the rest of my already peeled beets that had already been steamed in preparation for making relish and ketchup, and I cut them up. Oh, no, my audio ended on... Why did you stop? Okay, YouTube listeners. Uh, I have to scratch my nose. Um, my audio just stopped recording. I don't know why. This is when you save and you go back and say, what was I rambling on about, really? 
And now I have to edit in and figure out what I was saying. Ah! Okay, so the whole beat chip thing, you're going to have to hear that again. Sorry. Microsoft is not installing new errors, buddy. <laughs> it's because I'm on a Mac. But my Mac might be uncomfortably full right now. And I did spill egg white on it last week. So I'm not sure how happy it is right now if you got that one. Okay, but I say so I save the file and then I edit the file and then I go back and listen to. Ooh, carrots, spinach, lettuce. That sounds good. This is how the sausage is made, Kevin. The, the whole point of this thing on YouTube is I, I can take your questions live, but you can also see how I actually make the sausage because I think other some other people will just keep recording and go back and edit. And what I've learned is if I edit as I go, it takes me a whole lot less time finding where I need to edit. So the best thing I can ever do is edit as I go. So now we're going to go back into beet chips. Another thing that I've heard you could do that I heard on social media uh, is beet chips. And the person who told me that, I can't remember who it was, but the minute I heard it, I took the beets I had that were already peeled and they'd already been steamed to make relish or ketchup. And I cut them up and I sprinkled on, like I did trays in my Excalibur dehydrator and each tray was a different flavor. Some were just salt. Some had everything bagel spice mix on them. Some of them had some of these other fun spice mixes that Melissa White makes. If you are on the MeWe group, you'll know who that is. She makes great spice mixes. And then I dehydrated those. I did it overnight. And the next day they were still not chip like they were still kind of rubbery. So I let them go about another six hours. And they were a little more crunchy, but not really crunchy. They were still kind of rubbery. And I decided maybe that's just, they're kind of like dehydrated apple texture. And then I tasted it and it was really good. So in keeping with how my week has gone, though, I haven't been feeling that great. And there's been a lot going on. And so I decided to shove them in a gallon Ziploc bag, throw them in the freezer. And over the weekend, when I have some time to do some methodical food processing and storage, I will put those in small packets, like maybe four by five inches in my, in my vacuum packer. And I'll vacuum pack them because I think at, in this fall, I'm probably going to go more hiking, backpacking, going to do some more of that. Right now, it's really hot, so I'm not super stoked to go out in a backpack. But as things cool off, I'd like to get out a few more times before crazy coffee season comes. And I, I think that those beet chips will be really tasty when I have had a long day of hiking and sit down and it's a splash of, of beet flavor. And I really love beets, so that works pretty well. The other two recipes I got came from Janet. And uh, Janet is in our knitting group, by the way. And she first sent me beet relish, which basically instead of using cucumbers of your base for relish, you use beets. And it the one thing you do differently is you add pectin to it. So I was going to do that recipe. It asked for liquid pectin and I only have powdered pectin. And I had not taken the time to research how to turn powdered pectin into liquid pectin. I'm sure there's a way to do it. It can't be that hard. So... I was like, eh, I'm going to sit down and, and research this. And then I heard about beet chips and I made beet chips. So that beet relish recipe is one I plan to try. I will, I'll throw it out as a recipe of the week on the website. So y'all can check it out if you're still processing beets. And then when I've tried the recipe, I'll give you feedback on what I thought of it. The other recipe she sent me was beet ketchup. And I did a double batch of beet ketchup. And it was really tasty. That will come out as a recipe of the week too. It's out of a, like she sent me a photograph of a book <laughs> that had the recipe on it. My only complaint about this is the processing time on this recipe is for half pints. And I would have liked to have canned it in pints, but I looked and looked and looked and looked and looked and looked and, looked and did not find a processing time for pints, only half pints. And then of course, I didn't have any half pint jars around. I had quarter pints, like little teeny jelly jars. So I have about 4 million teeny jelly jars of ketchup. And then we also used it as a glaze on meatloaf. And it was really good. It tastes a lot like ketchup. And I've only had one person say they can taste the beets in it. I can taste the beets in it, though. So I don't know. People are just not expecting 
a, a ketchup looking thing to taste like beets. And so they say it doesn't taste like beets. I think it kind of does, but I think it's also really good. And then the last recipe I heard of came from a hip camper. So I'm starting, I, I'm on hip camp and I'm starting to get hip campers because I think people prefer to avoid hotels right now. And so like today, right after the show, somebody's arriving who's on their way somewhere else spending a night and they keep going and we have an outdoor shower and, you know, they don't have to worry about did the maid clean the bed because they're bringing their own bed. And this hip camper we had last weekend told me what she likes to do is take fresh garlic and beets and and puree them after cooking them and then add some spice and use it in place of spaghetti sauce on pasta. So I haven't tried that one either, but those are all the ways I discovered to try beets and I can't wait to try some of the recipes I haven't. That ketchup though is out of sight and I'll be using it on meatloafs, you know, probably all winter long in little teeny jars. <laughs> okay, next up is what is up in the garden. I harvested 25 pounds of tomatoes today. That's also off of the 12 plants that are in front of my house. And I will do another walkthrough on the tomato growing in front of the house and how it's going on YouTube so y'all can see. I believe that it's going to come to the end of its life before I'm done with it, meaning that its second purpose is to shade my house from the southern sun when it's really hot. And I have noticed a marked difference in my electric bill and my need for air conditioning because of my wall of tomatoes blocking the sun. Well, what's happening is the plants are getting older and sadly, blight is coming in. The late blight is coming in, even on the blight resistant varieties. Now, it's not as bad. It's like I, I've lasted longer than any other year and it's not coming on as fast and furiously as other years. And we've had a ton of rain but it is coming on. And so that's just informational for me. But that said, I've gotten 45 pounds total this year off of 12 plants. And if I make 100 pounds, that's about the average for tomato plants for that many plants is about 100 pounds, 90 to 100 pounds off 12 plants. So that's kind of cool. And since I like to can 150 to 200 pounds of tomatoes in the form of tomatoes and sauce and salsas and those sorts of things every year, that gives me a starting point for how many plants I really should plant for what I want to store if I want to grow everything here. And I have had a much more successful tomato year than many years in the past because they they're just they, they're having a more steady water supply. I think I think in, in my other iterations, I've you know, sometimes you don't notice they need water for a day and then you water them. They're doing great. I also last year. Patrick from MT Knives stopped through with his whole family and they had this giant pumpkin thing. It was like the shape of a butternut squash only with a long arm, but it was a pumpkin and not a butternut squash. I don't know how you would define them differently. They kind of look the same and taste the same, but he had been at a homesteading workshop or, or, or I guess outdoor sort of meetup and got this pumpkin from another family who grew them and they're an heirloom variety. I don't remember what kind it is. So I saved the seeds and put them in the ground and I have a Franken vine. The entire side of my hill. I mean, I have a, I'm looking out my window and way at the top of the hill is where I put some of these seeds. And there's this vine like threatening to come through my window right now. And on that, I have four or five of those pumpkins. So I'm optimistic that I'm going to get a harvest off that. The squash vine borers did not get that one. And that's often the case with the winter squash. But I have to say, I have summer squash that has now lived longer than usual. I planted them in a completely different place on the property. So next year, if I try squash, I will again plant them in a completely different place on the property and see if moving them around is part of what helps keep those squash vine borers away. Uh, I'm, I, you know, I'm pretty sure squash bugs and or borers are eventually going to come and knock them out like they always do. My cucumbers are getting terrible pollination, so I need to get out with a Q-tip and get on that. And then other than that, it got really hot two weeks ago. Things went on pause for putting on flowers. So right now we're having a lull in harvest except for the tomatoes because they were already in process right before the whole blazing hot thing happened. Okay, with that, guys, it is time for the main topic of today's show, and that is website Q&A. The reason we're doing this is so many of you have suddenly gotten a fire lit under your butts to start your business or to grow your business or to really finally get that website 
facing part of your business. And a lot of you are starting to see the value of online relationships in addition to direct connections. And so I've been having a lot of questions about websites and discussions about websites. And finally, I did an episode on websites because guess what, guys? I build websites. People pay me to build websites for them. I build them in WordPress almost all the time, right? So I, I wanted to have a measured discussion last week about what you really need to know about websites if you're going to build one and you know how to make that decision if you're going to build one or you're going to outsource it. Only you can answer that question for you, right? And then as a result of that, people started asking more questions. So I said, you know what, we'll do a live Q&A about websites a week after that episode comes out so that we can maybe defrag some of the things that are in people's way. And the first question comes from Richard. And he says, and this question comes all the time, right? The first question is Square, Stripe. WooCommerce payments, PayPal, Amazon Pay, do any of them double dip your money? Okay, so Richard, this is what I use. And it is not the only solution, but it's the, it's the one I have the most familiarity with. And the reason I use it is it's free and it is WooCommerce. So when I do a shopping cart, not every time, but when I do a shopping cart, I install WooCommerce and I try to organize my products in such a way that they're very simple. Shipping is simple. The number of variations are simple. The simpler, the better. Okay. Subscriptions add complexity. Delivery adds complexity. Variable pricing and sizes and all that adds complexity. And sometimes you need that. But if you spend a little time thinking, how can I make this really simple? Your whole life gets better. So that's WooCommerce. And that handles your products your product descriptions, your pricing, your shopping cart, and the way your store looks. Although you can work around the store thing. You can set your own store custom thing, but it, it will automatically fill into a store page. Payment is the second piece. And so you're, you know, you're asking, should I use WooCommerce payments, PayPal, Amazon pay, blah, blah, blah. Uh, personally, I usually start with the two that are easiest to set up and that's PayPal and Stripe. You go set up your accounts, you link them to your bank account, you enter some information from them to connect them to your WooCommerce and it happens flawlessly. I also take cryptocurrency. So if you're gonna do that, I use a system called Coin Payments. It's a little harder to set up. If you don't know a lot about cryptocurrency, well, research before you do it and maybe pay somebody to set it up for you. It should take, it takes half an hour to an hour to set it up for context on how much you should pay somebody to do that. Do any of them double fee dip your money? I've never been double dip feed. Now for Amazon pay, I've never used their service. The reason I haven't used their service is I'm not in love with Amazon. That's just me. Um, Square, I have set up Square. So my CBD friends who have been shut down by Stripe and PayPal because they're selling witch doctory content, right? Um, Square will approve CBD clients. You have to go through a special extra verification. And because of that, Square is what the CBD clients use. And I have another farmer client who uses it. Square was harder to set up than PayPal and then Stripe, but also not that hard to set up once you kind of figured out what was going on. The benefit of Square, if you do a farmer's market, is you can use it for your farmer's market with the swipey thing on your phone or your iPad. And you can use it on your website and have all of your transactions in one place. The reason I, on Holleros, let people do both problems, uh, both um, systems, PayPal and Stripe, is some people really hate PayPal. Other people are like, yes, I can log in with my PayPal username and password and pay and I don't have to dig my credit card out. Okay, so you have two kinds of people. And I figure if I give people more options, they're more likely to buy. So I give them both options. That's not the end all be all. If you do not hook up any payment option to WooCommerce, it can be sent, it can be set up just to take checks mailed to you. So really it depends on what you want to do. And then the second question from Richard is WooCommerce for a web store versus question mark. That entirely depends on your needs. I like WooCommerce because it is simple to deploy. They do not have ongoing fees. They work. 
They are well supported. It's easy to find developers to work on things if you need something done, right? And so I like WooCommerce. And if I can make it work, I make it work. Even if I need to pay, you know, the code guy to do something custom with it. Now, I know other people who really like Shopify because there's some security built in there. They have a whole back end system that you can use for inventory management. WooCommerce does too. And it's, it's a different system. They charge a percentage for, for their shopping cart. And it, so that, again, it goes back to you. I think Shopify might be a little easier for the layperson to get set up. Um, I've also recently heard that they've been having some issues because of the volume of people that they've had come in due to COVID and people going online. Okay, next question is going to come from YouTube. And this means I need to vamp a, li a little bit on my podcast while I read y'all's questions. Because I can't read and talk at the same time, guys. And I just put it on pause. And I need to scratch my nose really bad. Okay, so... <laughs> Would you share a questionnaire for designing the website? Yes. I could put that. You mean like the one that asks you what your business purpose is? Probably. Okay. So I'm going to answer that question from Kira. The next question comes from Kira on YouTube, and she says, would you share your questionnaire for designing a website? I think she means the content, the thing I make people fill out before they I build them a website, unless they already have their content figured out. And the answer is, yes, I'll share it. I'll put it out as a blog post on Living Free in Tennessee. It's going to take me a week to get that done. And I am going to cut out some of the questions I ask, like, what is the hexadecimal code for the color schemes you like and stuff like that? Because that's more specific to building the website. But I'll put the content stuff out. That makes sense. We'd be happy to share that with you. Kevin from YouTube asks, have you ever used Square Online Store? Kevin, no. <laughs> no I haven't used Square much. I've only done integrations for uh, for the, the clients I have. And you know, they're, they're just integrating with WooCommerce. The next question I have came from online and YouTube live. It's from our friend Sue LaPreece. Hi, Sue. She asks, what storage do you recommend for video, audio, and photos? That answer, Sue, is an it's depend it depends thing. So if you have a lot of downloads, Amazon has servers you can use for that. To get that set up on your website isn't cheap. I mean, you're looking at probably, I'm going to guess, $800 to $1,000 to set that up. And what that does is it puts all of the audio and the video on their server, and then that charges based on usage, okay? So podcasters who have a lot of downloads and have outgrown a service like Libsyn or... Is it Kava? There's a whole bunch of different specific audio hosts. We'll move to their own server or an Amazon server. The risk with the Amazon server is you get a bunch of downloads, the price goes up. And if you don't have a bunch of downloads every month, there's a monthly fee for, for your hosting. The price goes down. If you have a bunch of downloads, though, hopefully you're making money. That's always been my thought. I am going to be probably moving off of Libsyn and onto Amazon soon with my podcast because I've sort of outgrown the, the Libsyn environment. But it's a hard choice for me because that means I have to migrate everything over. So it's a good question to ask as you're starting something. Other places that work well for storing video is YouTube. Or um, what's that other one? Ooh, I can't remember the name right now. It'll come to me. But YouTube doesn't charge you anything for the storage and you can have unlimited plays, but then you are stuck with YouTube's terms of use, right? They can turn your video off anytime they want to. It's not quick time. What's the word I'm forgetting? Come on now, guys. Help me out on the YouTube. Sometimes when I do Q&As, I look like an idiot because I forget words. This is one of those times. That's okay, though. Vimeo! Yes, thank you. 
So the other host that a lot of people use is Vimeo. That's what Curtis Stone uses for his videos. It's another paid service. They specialize in video. As far as photos, if you optimize your photos for your website, which means is to make them a smaller resolution, you, you usually can put them on your website server. Um, if you're already using another server like Amazon, then you can put them there too. It doesn't matter. I'm not sure unless you're doing a, a photo gallery that you need to do your photos off of there. So that just depends. So th those are some options. What I don't recommend is audio and video hosted natively on your server. And for that matter, if you have downloadable PDFs of meat processing guides, like we have in the member portal, don't put it on your server because if you have a bunch of downloads of that, it can bump up the cost of your web server and your web server is for your website, not for documents. So that's my thoughts on hosting and where you put those. Next question comes from Kurt and it's from the Facebook group. He said, should I post prices? I love how he gave me no details on that. So Kurt, should you post prices? Yes. Oh, wait, maybe I should talk about this a little bit more. So when I sell coffee, I post my prices because I want people to go to my website and buy it online. So my answer to this if you, is if you want them to buy it from your website through a shopping cart, by all means, post your prices. I also know that I sell websites and don't post my prices about what a website costs. And that's because it depends on what a person needs in a website. So I can give a range of what they usually cost. But then if somebody comes to me with a 2 million part database that needs to be turned into a shopping cart, that's a totally different scale than somebody who's selling, you know, 25 to 50 different kinds of teas, right? Two different, two totally different tools are going to be used a whole bunch of different amount of time to do that. So I think, and this is just what I think. It's an opinion. A lot of people like to drive their sales funnel to where they get you to contact them before they give you a price. People who do that lose my business. I would like to know what universe I'm in before I talk to somebody. And in, unless it's something that I understand, like a website or a coaching program that needs to be customized. That being said, I'm in the process of changing the Sparkcom group to have more of our prices because I do coaching and a session with me is 250 bucks. But if you buy a set of section uh, of sessions, the price drops, right? So I want to make that clear in 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 my website. So people aren't thinking I'm charging a thousand dollars a session, which people do. People do that. And they get like, when I did corporate, it was a minimum of a $4,000 a day. Right. So that's a scale of pricing and not knowing I think is hard. So my, it's just as my opinion, Kurt is putting your pricing out there to the extent you can helps and really think about your pricing. Next one comes from Letty. Letty asks, how can I get a good contact form in WordPress? Right now I've got a link to a Google form that requests the information I need from prospective clients. Well, Letty, the, hmm, how do I answer this best? So the, the tool I like to use is called Gravity Forms and it costs money every year. It's I think $49 a year, something like that. You can get a developer license. I do, so I have unlimited installs. So my clients end up getting that as part of their package deal. But Gravity Forms, the reason I like it is it's very flexible in what you can ask. It combines it into a spreadsheet if you want it to. And it even lets me add checkout services. So if the only thing you're selling is consulting hours, Sue, then you can set up a form that asks all the questions you want and ask, and then um, asks for you know, how many hours of consulting do you want and allows you to do a checkout through PayPal or Stripe. And you don't even have to mess with WooCommerce. That's one way to do it. And then if you're a consultant, you do want those questions. So there's a lot of times when you're selling something where you just kind of need to know what are these things. I've, I've set one up for a CSA. Uh, I use that for my registration for my events now. I used to use a, an event specific plugin and I decided that Gravity Forms works better for me. 
And so, you know, this year, now that I figured out how to add that payment thing at the bottom, <laughs> this year, I'm not even going to mess with my other shopping cart on my website because I don't need to. And it's the only thing with gravity forms, Letty, is that you may end up needing to pay somebody to do some CSS uh, coding for you to make it look prettier. So I've, I end up having to say like in CSS code, make this that color or put this background that way. And, and that is something that may end up costing a little money too, depending on if you like how the default form looks or not. The default form does pull from the CSS uh, or from the style sheets in your website template. So it's trying to look good, but just because it's trying to look good doesn't mean it, it looks good. And, and that's something where if it's, if it's a form that you're having people fill out for a product, sometimes it's, a little, it's worth putting a little bit of money in. The next question comes from Loretta on the YouTube group. As a service provider, should you have hourly price listed? That is a big, that is not a website question. That is a business question, but it's a good question. Should you list your hourly rate? Hmm. Again, that depends on the kind of business you're in. I think it's, it helps people understand what they're paying for when you tell them what your hourly rate is. So for example, if I'm doing a website quote, I usually just give a price for the website. And the reason I do that is parts of website development cost $75 an hour and other parts cost $150 to $200 an hour. When I build a website, it's not only me, right? It's if there's something that's above my pay grade, I outsource it to a, a group of trusted people I work with. That's why we're called Spark Communications Group, right? And, you know, when you're paying some guy to mess with a database, he, he's going to cost a little bit more. So I explain that to customers, but I have other customers that really want to know the hourly rate. So I do have some that just pay me hourly uh, and I just haven't published that rate online because it, you know, some hours take more hours to do, if that makes sense. So there's a billable hour and then there's the hours it takes you to do it. So I think if you have something that makes sense to price hourly, go ahead and do that. If you, I think the bigger thing is clarity of pricing linked with what people are going to get is your most important thing because then they have a frame through which to make their decision. And if you know approximately what your competitors are charging and you're charging more or less, you can explain, this is what it is. This is what I do that's better. And that's why that's the price. pausing the recording on the audio again to read is a set price for a certain service include those. Yes, I totally do that. I totally do that. Um, if there's a set price for a certain service, like, a, you know, for me, a coaching call is what it is. One call is 250, but a set of five calls is a different price. It's 200. And the reason that is, is when we get into a series of coaching calls, I, we roll from one to the next and the prep time in between is a little bit better. So I've figured out longer coaching programs over time take less prep time. But for just one call, I do a whole bunch of prep time. I do the call and then I do a whole bunch of post work. So anyway, I hope that helps you, Loretta. I didn't put that on my podcast. <laughs> so I'm out of questions, guys. Anybody else on YouTube have a question? If not, I'm going to wrap it. And now I'm giving you guys a chance to catch up because there's always like a buffer on YouTube before, <laughs> before you're like, wait, she said that. Oh no, she moved on. It's always kind of funny. And yes, automagic Kira is my favorite word. It's, it's the thing I'm focusing on in holler roast coffee is how can I automate things more? This has resulted in some of my clients getting the wrong order contents. So <laughs> I have to, then I'm like, oops, that automation went over automatic and, They've all been really understandable. Are your products that are printable linked to on demand, like t-shirts and mugs? Okay. I'm going to start the recording, Sue, and get to that. Okay. We have another question from YouTube from Sue, and she says, are your products that are printable linked to an on-demand service, like t-shirts and mugs? And the, the answer is mine are. So I have t-shirts through Spreadshirt at livingfreeintennessee.com. I set up the Spearco 2020 site and that is through Printful. However, the bumper stickers, these things, you cannot do these on demand. 
It's really irritating. So I have to mail those. And I printed like a couple hundred of them just for that project. And I mail those out about once a week. But to the for me, from a management standpoint, I, I highly prefer print on demand for things like that. And then that integrates with my WooCommerce shopping cart in the case of Spirco 2020. So t-shirts and hats are products on my website and they synchronize with the plant platform, which is called Printful that prints them. However, since COVID has happened, Printful has had an enormous turnaround time, like six weeks to get a t-shirt to somebody. So it's important if you use a vendor like that, that you know things like that and you communicate it on your website that it's not going to be out the next day. Spreadshirt, on the other hand, has been turning around things fine for a while. So I don't know why one is more than the other. My, my suspicion is Printful is more dependent on a larger international network of providers and Spreadshirt is a smaller company. And, and then, you know, right now when you're a small company, it's actually a little easier to fulfill when you have supply chain problems because, you know, like for me, if one coffee is out, I have four other varieties I can roast. I can take that off my website and I can just get a different kind of coffee. If you're a big coffee provider, you have to have the coffee that is, you know, major Dickinson's all the time. And if your supply shipment is delayed, it is what it is and you can't do anything about it. So because those two companies are different scales when compared to each other, I think that's why that happens. Okay, guys, we are out of questions on the YouTube and on social media for websites. If you continue to have questions, let's take this conversation over to social. And you can interact with me a couple of ways on social. One, we have a Facebook group that's called the Living Free in Tennessee Coffee Break Group. You just have to answer a few questions. If you don't know an answer, just make one up. It's okay. Just it's it, the whole point is I'm trying to see if you're a real person or a sex bot because I don't let sex bots in to the best of my ability. And then MeWe, MeWe.com, there's a Living Free in Tennessee group there as well. Both have a pretty active community and I would love to keep talking about website questions if you have them. If you like the show and want to support the work I'm doing here, you can do it in two ways. One, get your coffee at hollerose.com. Two, become a member over at livingfreeintennessee.com. Just click on membership in the upper window and you will get benefits like access to pre-recordings of some of our webinars and the sessions at the workshops along with shared discounts. With that, guys, go out, make it a great week. Stop recording. So yes, that is watching the sausage being made. The most important thing I do here, guys, on YouTube is I hit save right now because it's a real bummer when you get done with your, your recording and then, boom, lost the file. That's happened to me one time and I, <laughs> I had to go record it a second time. It was awful. Anyway, thanks for tuning in on YouTube. It's always fun to be able to see the live chat. And I had my glasses on so I could actually see what you were doing and didn't pour any egg on my keyboard like I did last week. That was kind of nice, right? <laughs> anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. We will uh, we'll do some more live recordings of the podcast next week. I think I have an interview show Friday and those don't live record all that well. So we will do that. You know, we'll jump back in and I'm going to do the jump episode. So look for that. I, I get to make up my sick day. Have a great day, guys.